Jeans and Memorial Lecturer, Ambassador Richard Verma. Ambassador Verma is the 25th ambassador from the United States to India, but is the first one of Indian origin. <coughs> it's a particular honor to have him with us today. Very great distinction. He was appointed by President Obama in September of 2014 and was confirmed by the US Senate and sworn in by Secretary John Kennedy on December 2014. So another interesting thing is that the Indian mission that he heads in, uh, or the, the US mission that he heads in India is one of the largest missions of its kind in the world. And virtually every department of the US government is represented there. So the largest, perhaps the largest number of consulates anywhere in the world is in that mission. So, so uh, Ambassador Verba previously was, for, he was Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs in the Obama administration. He's also led the State Department's effect, uh, efforts on Capitol Hill, and he's served as a senior member of Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton's team as well. So we have incredible experience here in foreign service and in looking after our country's welfare. But what's especially important for us is that he's right now positioned in the Wilder School, we have a program on Homeland Security. Secretary uh, Ambassador Verma was previously the senior national security advisor to Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. So we have a particular connection to one of our programs here. He has also been a veteran of the U.S. Air Force, which, you know, as proud Virginians, many of us know that the Air Force is very dear to us. And it's very important. It's very interesting. You know, we have person of Indian origin who has reached this level of excellence and who has previously served the country in the Air Force. He's uh, also served in Eastern Europe before, and prior to that, he was a law. He was a partner in a major law firm, uh, global law firm of Steptoe Johnson LLP. So he must have taken a severe pay cut to that. <laughs> Ambassador Verba has also been appointed previously as a commissioner to the, he was in the commissioner to the Prevention of Weapons of Mass Destruction and Terrorism Commission that was chaired by Senators Graham and Talent. And he is also you know, one of the co-authors of that famous, well-known book in international development, which was called The World at Risk, which came out soon after that. And he's a distinguished co-author of that book. He is currently on the, he has served on the boards of the Clinton Foundation, on the National Democratic Institute, on Human Rights First, and he was a member of the Secretary of State's Foreign Affairs Policy Board from 2011 to 14. His list of awards is long, so I won't, uh, I will restrict it to one or two only. He has the State Department's Distinguished Service Award and the Council of Foreign Relations International Affairs Commission. And as President Rao mentioned, he was cited by India Abroad as one of the 50 most distinguished and influential Indian Americans. That was already some time ago. I'm sure it's climbed up even higher <laughs> since. Uh, Ambassador Verma did not go to BCU, but he did go to Georgetown University, not too far away, and to American University in Washington, D.C. for his law degrees. And before that, he, he, he studied industrial engineering at his master. University. And as a civil engineer myself, I have high regard for this as a man. So with that, please join me in welcoming our distinguished Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. There's so much in that introduction um, that I should comment on. The severe pay cut is very, um, <laughs> very true. My, fa my father still wonders <laughs> what happened. You had a good paying job <laughs> and, you, um, and you left it. Um, Dean Burma, who is not my brother, but thank you very much for the introduction, for the invitation. President Rao, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Governor Wilder, thank you. It's really an honor to meet you um, in person. You've been a real role model and inspiration to all of us who uh, have been in public service for many years. So thank you for everything that you've done. Well, this is a real, this is a real treat for me. Um, 
I've given a, a lot of talks over the last uh, year and a half since I've been in, in India. Um, and people have asked me, why are you out talking so much? <laughs> you know, aren't, aren't you going to run out of, um, aren't you going to run out of things to say? And um, <clears throat> maybe one day we will. But uh, it's really been an amazing uh, 15 or 16 months that we've been there. I've had the good fortune of traveling all over India, eight, 18 of 29 states. I've been to 50 cities. I, we do about one trip every eight or nine days across the country. Um, and we're, you know, we're doing all the bilateral stuff in Delhi and then we're getting out talking to students, young people, civil society, business leaders. There's just so much happening and um, so much going on. I got there, as I said, um, I really got lucky, I have to say, for those of you who follow the Senate and Senate confirmation processes, um, mine was relatively brief. I, I was nominated in September of 2014 and I was confirmed in December of 2014. Now, what, what, we, what you don't know is that the day I was nominated, the Senate went out for the election recess. So there was no Senate to actually um, do anything. Um, but from the time I had my hearing, which was on December 2nd, to the time I was confirmed, it was seven days. So that was, we kind of broke a lot of records. Now I have to thank the subcommittee chairman at that point, was your senator, Senator Kane. And he was the chairman of the South Asia subcommittee that had jurisdiction on it. He's a real expert on India, he's a real expert on the region, and he was a great partner um, in crime to have helped me through the Senate process. It also helped that I had worked for the Senate leader for five years, but um, after, the, after the hearing, um, you know, Senator Kane pulled me aside. He said, you know, I just have one question to ask you. He said, you know, it's always been curious to me that every Indian person I meet in Virginia seems to know every other Indian person in the world. <laughs> he said, so sometimes I feel like there's only 150 Indians in the entire world <laughs> because everyone in Virginia knows who they are. And I said, well, that's funny you mentioned that because I had a very similar experience growing up. My dad would do this to me. No matter what Indian person we would meet, anywhere in the United States. Taxi driver in New York City, CEO of a company. My dad would always find some connection to that person. From the same town, went to the same school. <laughs> this is your auntie's best sister's friend's cousin, <laughs> neighbor. <laughs> She's like your sister. You have to <laughs> feed her dinner. Um, and finally, you know, at some point growing up, you say to your dad, you know, dad, you're just making this up. <laughs> right? It's, it's, not, it's not true. So we, it was kind of a running joke in our house for a long time. And so just fast forward to the fall of 2009, and I'm serving as Assistant Secretary of State, and Prime Minister Singh was coming to the White House for an official state visit. I get a call from the White House saying we'd like to come, we'd like you to come to the White House and be part of the greeting party to Prime Minister Singh. This is a pretty big deal. So I call my dad, I said, Dad, you're not gonna believe this. I've been invited to meet the Prime Minister of India. He said, that's great. You make sure you tell him we're from the same place. <laughs> So I said, look, um, Dad, I, I can't lie to the current Prime Minister <laughs> of, uh, of India. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't like that. He wouldn't like that. And uh, he calls me the next day. He said, you're going to tell the Prime Minister we're from the same place. I said, Dad, I can't do that. He calls me the morning of the ceremony yet again. I said, no, I'm not doing it. So I get to the, I get to the White House. Uh, there's about 12 of us there to greet uh, the Prime Minister. And I'm going through the going through the line. President sees me. He he knew me from the Senate. Uh, frankly, I think the president was relieved there was one Indian American in the line to uh, <laughs> to greet greet the prime minister. And uh, 
he says, Mr. Prime Minister, this is Rich Verma. He's Assistant Secretary of State. Prime Minister is looking at me from head to toe. He's kind of staring at me. He said, you're Indian, aren't you? I said, <laughs> I said yes, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, our, our family's from India. He then asked me, he said, where's your father from? <laughs> I said, uh, my father's from Jalandhar. Prime Minister turns to the president. He said, his father and I are from the same place. <laughs> now, um, the worst part about that is that when your parents are right, it's just <laughs> such a hard thing, uh, hard thing to accept. Um, but we, it really is a, a very small uh, place, despite the 1.3 billion people. There, uh, there are a lot of connections. But it, it has been a, uh, it has been a big honor. It's a big title to have. There's a lot of famous people that have held this uh, job: John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, Daniel Moynihan, um, Chester Bowles. I could go on and on through the, the list of famous uh, Americans. Um, but the title of ambassador doesn't always um, get you what you think it, it should. And I'll just give you um, a small example. I have an uh, eight-year-old daughter who was on the playground having a particularly um, unpleasant run-in with an eight-year-old boy. She was trying to resolve it on her own, trying to resolve, you know, trying to use all the skills we had taught her. Um, and it just wasn't working. Finally, she pulled out the, uh, the big trump card. She said, look, kid, my dad is the US ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> he said, whoa, are you serious? And she said, yeah. And she thought she, she got this worked out. Kid comes back about 10 seconds later. He said, what's a US ambassador? <laughs> So it doesn't always have the <laughs> kind of punch. Um, look, I, I have some uh, prepared remarks. And I, if you'd indulge me, maybe I could just go through them. Um, because what I wanted to do was not give a foreign policy speech or a geopolitical speech or um, US-India defense relations. I did want to talk. Uh, about the people that make up this relationship and why, if we're having such a good um, kind of experience in U.S.-India relations, <coughs> one of the theories of the case has a lot to do with uh, a lot of you uh, sitting in this room who have uh, worked pretty hard uh, at trying to make this relationship work. And you, you don't even know that you've been doing that. But a lot of you have uh, made great sacrifices, uh, left your country behind, uh, worked, started over here. And I actually think that's the hidden story of this U.S.-India relationship. And that's what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. And then hopefully we can uh, take some questions. But uh, I think some, I told some of you, I, I left uh, New Delhi uh, this past weekend and arrived back in the United States on Monday after a long flight to which I am growing increasingly uh, accustomed. And as long, on that flight, as long and tedious as it seems today, I was, as I said, reflecting on other journeys much more arduous by generations of Americans and Indians who have gone before us. Travelers that were motivated by curiosity, ambition, or belief that the unique affinities that unite India and the United States hold immense potential for the benefit of humankind. The discovery that has impressed me most deeply since arriving in India more than one year ago is the profound depth of the bonds between the people of peoples of our two countries. At almost every turn in India, 
I am faced with reminders of those bonds, not just today, but stretching back centuries on the shoulders of great, but also sometimes nameless individuals. These bonds were built through journeys, hundreds of audacious, farsighted, and sometimes risky journeys by visionaries who recognized that something shared by our two peoples was special and unique. So I want to talk to you about several of those travelers today, some of whom may be familiar to you, but also others whose important achievements may be less well known. But the legacy of these intrepid travelers continues to inspire the formation of new bonds between our countries every day. And is one of the reasons I'm so confident that this relationship holds such immense promise for the future. So just imagine for a moment setting off on a journey by sail to a destination halfway around the world. A months-long journey across perilous seas to a place of which you had only heard the briefest mention. There would be no guarantee of success or that you would ever return to your home and family. Yet something in what you heard about that distant land spoke to your belief in the possibilities of human cooperation. A man from the Indian city known today as Chennai took such a journey over 200 years ago. Paying for his own passage on a British clipper, he set out for America to promote the idea of trade between the world's newest democracy and India. He would have set out for Madras, probably stopped in Madagascar, and was likely already weary before rounding the Cape Horn several weeks later. What dreams kept him going during the tedium of the voyage up the Gold Coast of Africa and as he approached the pirate-filled waters off the Barbary Coast? He could have easily ended his journey to pursue opportunities in Rotterdam or London, but something pushed him to sail onward across the Atlantic to a new country less than two decades old. His name is actually lost to us in history, but the archival records tell us that in 1790, he arrived alone in Salem, Massachusetts, one of the crucibles of the new American Republic. We can only marvel at the sheer audacity of such a visionary mission. When I consider the 100 plus billion in US-India trade today, and the likelihood that it will continue to grow exponentially, I think back to that nameless traveler and remember that our trade relationship began with a spark of belief and a certainty that a journey could bring our peoples closer together. Now the United States and India both have our own profoundly rich historical and cultural traditions. But one only need scratch the surface to find examples of how our people have embraced and influenced each other. From the figure of the Indian deity Ganesh that President Obama carries in his pocket every day for good luck, to the 19th century visits to Pennsylvania factories by industrialist J.N. Tata that helped inspire his creation of one of the largest business houses in the world. Our ideas and cultures have inspired some of our people's greatest achievements. It has been a privilege for me to be in New Delhi during this time of increasing strategic alignment between the United States and India. Our militaries are training and operating together more closely than ever before. Our scientists are working on new treatments for tuberculosis and advances in neonatal and maternal health. American-designed locomotives will soon be plying the fabled Indian railways. And NASA played an instrumental role in the recent launch of India's Mars probe. The extraordinary personal connection between President Obama and Prime Minister Modi 
has certainly helped propel these remarkable developments. But the amazing speed and scope of the expansion of our ties would not have been possible without a foundation of centuries of friendship and shared values between our two peoples. The thousands of individual journeys that together make up this mosaic of friendship are not limited to statesmen or multinational executives. It is composed of the daily efforts of countless Americans and Indians working in their adopted communities to advance the values of our countries both hold dear. I see this every day. For instance, through the efforts of James Thurston, who was working with governments in India to help ensure that mobile phones include applications for the visually impaired. And here in the United States, we are fortunate to have among us Indian Americans like Pradeep Kalka, who since his father's own murder in an act of hatred at the Sikh temple in Wisconsin, has worked tirelessly through his organization called Serve to Unite to turn despair into hope by teaching America's youth that the redemptive power of tolerance and acceptance transcends race, religion, or national origin. Even those areas that on the surface seem most uniquely Indian or American, on closer examination can sometimes show mutual influence in surprising ways. For example, those of you from California will know that the surname Gill is common among the Chicano community in the Western United States. You may be surprised to learn that the origins of this name lie in the Punjab region of India and was the result of a confluence of waves of Indian Sikh and Mexican immigrants who arrived on the West Coast in the first decade of the 20th century as they sought to build better lives for their children by working in the orchards and farms off the west coast, these two communities gradually merged and produced a vibrant Punjabi Mexican patch in the quilt of American diversity. Today, much of the world knows India through Bollywood and its imaginative Marvelous, marvelously imaginative films. However, few people realize that an American director played an important role in the development of Indian film traditions. In 1935, film director Ellis R. Dungan departed for India at the suggestion of his Indian cinematography classmate at the University of Southern California. Dungan worked as a film director in India for 15 years, making many successful Tamil and Hindi films. In fact, his 1936 work, Sathi Livathi, no, I pronounced that improperly, helped make a name for South Indian cinematic superstar M.G. Ramachandran, or M.G.R., as he's commonly known who would go on to become a household name in India and the future chief minister of Tamil Nadu. As the story of Ellis Dungan shows, the United States and India, perhaps more than any other two countries, admire visionaries. What is more remarkable is that we have always welcomed each other's visionaries and integrated them into the fabric of our societies. It is this characteristic more than any other which has propelled the relationship between our countries to the flowering that we see today. Now I've been saying to people that 2015 was one of the very strong years in U.S.-India relations and we're working hard to ensure that 2016 is even better. I could go through all the categories and all the data that shows record-breaking year and two-way trade over $100 billion, the record-breaking number of Indian students in the United States, over 135,000, 
the number of Indian visitors to the U.S. over 1.1 million and so on and so on. We broke every category that we keep records for last year. But perhaps I can better demonstrate the increasing closeness between our two countries through a few illustrations of our work together. You know, in the closing weeks of 2015, leading up to the historic agreement reached in Paris to combat climate change, President Obama and Prime Minister Modi utilized their new secure telephone lines on three different occasions. Discussing and negotiating key aspects of the agreement and, sure, and ensuring that a comprehensive deal was reached. For those of you who have seen this relationship over the years, think of what I just said. The leader of the United States and the leader of India now have a secure phone. You press a button and it rings on the other side. They negotiated an international agreement that India was a big part of and that we were very um, committed to securing. Think about that. Think about what that leads to future cooperation. India's defense minister landed on a U.S. aircraft carrier in the Atlantic Ocean with our Secretary of Defense last year to confer on advanced carrier and fighter operations as part of cooperation in the maritime domain. Think of that possibility even five years ago. An Indian Minister of Defense landing on a U.S. aircraft carrier. And as I noted, NASA provided navigational support to India's Mars mission. And now both our countries are discussing a possible second joint mission to the Red Planet. Our health researchers and medical professionals, as I said, are working together to help end TB in India. They've set up advanced surveillance and detection efforts as part of global health security. And they are now working in several African countries to promote child and maternal health. General Electric was selected to make hundreds of locomotives in India. Boeing will make parts of the Apache attack helicopter in India. And Indian companies invested over $15 billion in American cities and states. Your governor led a successful trade mission to India. And President Obama was the first US president ever to be invited as the chief guest to India's Republic Day and the first U.S. president ever to visit India twice during his term. Now these examples just barely scratch the surface of our current work together. And I really believe our future cooperation is even brighter. We are well aligned as the world's largest and oldest democracy to forge even stronger ties ahead. President Obama has said we aim to be India's best partner. Prime Minister Modi has encouraged us to think big beyond the transactional nature of the relationship to the global impact we can have on peace and prosperity. But fundamentally, our two countries are stronger when we work together. We are stronger when we come together. And as I said, underlying and facilitating all of this government, government cooperation are the remarkable stories of our people. These are the ties that bind us together today and in the past, even when our government cooperation may not have been hitting on all cylinders. We have to continue to recognize, celebrate, and prop up these amazing people. And you have so many examples right here at this institution. You are as much a part of the U.S.-India success story as we are in government. And I want to congratulate you for all that you've done here at VCU to promote students, faculty, studies, and programs like this lecture series that continue to link our two countries together. So thank you for everything you're doing here. Let me give you um, one more example that I'm particularly proud of, and that's my own family's story. As I said to a couple of you, one of the great perks of this job is I get to talk about my parents a lot. So let me take you back to the year 1947 and a time when South Asia was undergoing significant upheaval and experiencing the largest mass migration ever recorded. 
My grandmother and mother were living in the city of Jung, which is today in Pakistan. In the partition of India that year, my grandmother and mother, my mother at the time was just a young girl in middle school, would undergo the difficult journey from Jung, resettling in Jalandhar, Punjab, starting over and rebuilding their lives. This theme of starting over is one my mother would experience again when she came to the U.S. many years later. The other theme that helped them endure these difficult times was education. My grandmother was a school teacher in Jung. She would go on to be a school teacher for economically disadvantaged girls in Jalandhar at a school that is still teaching young women today and a place that I had the great privilege of visiting last year. My grandmother was a strong and smart woman, an incredible role model. And I had the good fortune of staying with her in the summer of 1974 when I was just a small kid. But old enough to remember her two room flat down a long alleyway in a crowded Punjabi neighborhood. A flat with no stove, no refrigerator, no flush toilet. This was also a place I got to visit again last year. Not only was it so gratifying to go back, but so many people came to meet me saying that they knew my grandmother and mother. And a few women in particular told me that it was my grandmother that helped set them on the right track and they never would have been educated but for her insistence, her guidance, and her mentorship. And that was exactly what she required of my mother, a commitment to education. So my mother would go to college, become a teacher and social worker at a time when very few women were making it past the eighth grade. My mother would become the head of a girls school in Jalandhar. And that's where she met my father, who similarly was the head of a boys school there. My father's story is also one of overcoming odds and also one grounded in education. He was the eldest of 11 children. He grew up in a small village in Punjab and he was the only one in his family ever to be formally educated. He had a talent for both math and for literature and he would pursue both subjects, getting degrees in both and going on to lead a teacher's training college there. And in 1963, a new journey started again. My father would get an academic scholarship to pursue his master's degree at the University of Northern Iowa. And he tells a classic immigrant story. He left my mom and at that time my brother and three sisters behind and as he describes it, he landed in New York City with $24 and a Greyhound bus ticket to Northern Iowa. Now sometimes it's $17, sometimes it's $24, but <laughs> the, the point is he didn't have much money. <laughs> he didn't know, he didn't know a single person, but like millions of other immigrants before and after him, he was so warmly welcomed here. It doesn't mean things were easy, in fact, far from it. My mother and siblings would join him two years later and he would go on to get his doctorate in English literature. He would get his first teaching opportunity in Pennsylvania in the University of Pittsburgh school system. That's where I grew up. That's where my mom would become a special needs teacher. That's where they built a new life for all of us. And that's where he retired just a few years ago as Professor Emeritus of English Literature. Now I'm pretty certain I could not have done what they did. Almost certain of that. The bravery, the strength, the fortitude that they displayed day after day, year after year, all the while singularly focused on ensuring their children would have a more stable and secure future. I can also assure you it is not lost on me how, how unlikely it is that I am serving as the American ambassador to India. 
as the son of these fine people who worked so hard, overcoming so many odds along their journey. Now what it does is it makes me extra committed to ensure we live up to the high standards they have set and also ensure that we continue to give people the opportunity to pursue their dreams and fulfill their aspirations as my parents did. Immigrants from all over the world have helped make this country great, including the 3.5 million Americans with roots in India. And that is something we must never forget. So in conclusion, imagine for a moment setting off on a journey that will take place not too far into the future. Young Americans and Indians, maybe kids in elementary or middle school today, preparing to launch together on a perilous but historic exploration of deep space, perhaps as part of the first manned mission to Mars. It will be a journey fraught with peril and uncertainty, yet on it may hinge the future of human civilization itself. I have no doubt that this journey will take place and that American and Indian visionaries will be among those that go forth into the galaxy carrying the future of our species with them. And driven by that spark of belief in the possible, our future will be secure in their hands. I can think of no other two countries whose thoughts, ideals, and aspirations for the betterment of humankind are as intertwined as the United States and India. We are different countries, and we will not always see eye to eye on every issue, but the journeys by our visionaries, thought leaders, and everyday citizens looking to serve their fellow human beings will continue to increase, laying the groundwork for the most promising relationship of the future, and the future of the planet, and the human race. Thank you very much. This is unusual for an Indian American, you know, ambassador for, for an ambassador from the United States right. to be in this position. Right. And so we understand that you have kind of endeared yourself to them and you're part of them. But are there, in, in some ways, this question goes to the liability part of it. Are there times when you have to really assert your American identity? Your daughter did it. We, we know that your daughter flashed her gun. Yeah, she did. You know, but, yeah. But are there times when you have to remind people that? You're really a member of the diaspora. You're not an Indian citizen. You're an American. Yeah. No, it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, you know, a lot of people have, have asked me what it's like to be uh, Indian American serving in this job. And as I said, I'm, for me, I think everyone has to come at this question on their own. I'm very proud of, uh, of my roots. It's easy for me to talk about. And I think it's a, it's a great thing. And it was like that growing up. We were very proud of our roots. But it's also not that hard for me also to reconcile the, the roles. I, um, I served in the US Air Force. I worked for the Senate Majority Leader. I was a US Assistant Secretary of State. Um, and I'm there as the US Ambassador to India to advocate, support, defend, implement US policy. So that's, that's easily reconcilable for me. And the, the the good thing for me is that, as I tried to describe in the speech, we're becoming increasingly aligned. So 
you don't go in and you know pound your fist on the table. You really go in in a spirit of, of partnership, and we're trying to solve things that maybe five years ago, three years ago, we wouldn't have been able to solve. Whether it's on environment issues or trade issues or security issues, we're now. It's a very collaborative relationship. It doesn't mean we agree. We don't agree on everything. I don't know of any two countries in the world that agree on everything. Uh, but it's, it, it, at the same time, I don't discount being Indian American or the, or the, um, the pride that I feel. It is also an extra obligation as I described in ensuring that all these young people I meet, whether they're here or there, that you fight for them because I know how one <coughs> academic scholarship changed the whole trajectory of a family. So every visa, every scholarship, every exchange program, every uh, internship opportunity, every um, USAID program, those really matter to me because I know from personal experience the impact that we can have. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we have a lot of comments here. Sure. It's easier for me if I don't have to answer any questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first comment. I assure you, things have changed since then. <laughs> <laughs> I believe there may be a State Department rule against this. <laughs> to talk about these issues as much as you can. Um, we have a security partnership with Pakistan. We are trying to help stabilize a, 
dangerous situation in many parts of the country. Um, and the assistance that we provide Pakistan is a mix of civilian and military aid. People don't know that two-thirds of our assistance now is civilian. The military assistance has gone way down. The F-16s were part of an older announcement made several years ago. These were the last eight with the idea to help provide a, a counter-terror and counter-insurgency tool to aid in going after groups that present a threat to Pakistanis, to Indians, to, to others. So that's the, that's the purpose of the, of the plan. I understand the concerns um, by the Indian government, but, and, and we, we talk about it a lot. I will say, when we look at what we're doing with India and the security partnership that we're building, I said this before, there's really no other country outside of our NATO alliance that we're doing uh, what we're doing with India. We're talking about building aircraft carriers together. We're talking about building fourth generation fighters together. We're talking uh, about co-developing and producing military items for export to third countries. Uh, India does more military exercises with the United States. The Special Forces exercise. I went to the Army exercise in the state of Washington where they were practicing counterterrorism operations. The, we called on the Indian military to evacuate Americans out of Yemen. Our humanitarian and disaster assistance response teams worked together in the Nepal earthquake. So I could go on and on. I mean, we, this is going to be one of the most um, comprehensive and exciting security partnerships of the, of the future, so U.S. and India. You because in the, the same news that it struck on yeah. TV and the newspaper, the local people were more concerned than the government. The government of India officially did not react to the news as much because they probably know what it means to yeah. see it. Thank you. So maybe uh, if somebody. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if, if I move over this way, people will raise yeah. their hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. I, um, you mentioned Ambassador Bowles and Galbraith. Yeah. They were actually uh, more than 50 years ago that they were in India. Yes. And I hope that 50 years from today, your name. Will be in the same category. It'll be somewhere. I don't know which category. Yeah. <laughs> uh, instead of that, I was going to talk about your daughter because I have two daughters. And Ambassador Bowles, their daughter wrote a book called The Ambassador's Daughter. And it was written six, 55 years ago on her experiences when she was in, in India. No kidding. And her Indian friends would invite her all over the country. But it was a different age, a different time. Yeah. She traveled by train, unaccompanied by anybody in the women's compartment, of course. And she toured the whole country. Wow. And that would be a good reading material for your daughter because it, the last name is Bowles. And it is a okay. Good, you. good recommendation. So there's Ambassador Bowles' daughter, there's um, uh, Senator Moynihan's uh, daughter and wife have written extensively about, about India. And John Kenneth Galbraith has written a, um, boy, it's about this big. I keep it next to my bedstand, but it's all of his, um, it was his journal entries uh, from his time in India. And I think it's called an ambassador's um, diary or ambassador's reflections. And uh, it's an amazing book to read because in so many of the same questions and issues that he was having, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good to learn about how he handled them. But he didn't have Twitter or Facebook or um, <laughs> the pressures of social media. That, um. We have time for two more questions. Will we sign them? Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I'm asking this question because I believe there are a couple of students here who aspire to become ambassadors like you in the future. Can you just share with us briefly what your work entails on day to day basis? What's your job description? Gosh, that is such a funny question. Only because I say this all the time that um, 
When people ask me, why did you do this or why did you travel there, I actually say to them, you realize there's no job description to this job. <laughs> You get there on the first day and, and it's a pretty much a, a blank uh, sheet of paper and um, everyone, and, and that's not to say the State Department doesn't prepare you well, they do. There's a great, we have a, a great Foreign Service Institute and, and there's a lot of good training. But what you do in the job, um, you have to, you have to decide based on what the priorities are of the country. Now. Having said all that, it was very easy for me to figure out what it is were our priorities because I got there on January 2nd of 2015. Prime Minister Modi had come to Washington in September of 2014. Coming out of that meeting were about, oh, 40 to 50 different initiatives that the President and Prime Minister came up with. And then the President came to India in the third week in January, just three weeks after I got there. We came up with 80 plus different streams of work just coming out of that uh, three-day visit. So when people ask me, you know, like, what are you working on? What's your, what are your priorities? My priorities are the president's priorities. So um, that was really what, what we were focused on. And frankly, to this day, are still working on and we're building on them and coming up with new things. Now, what did I want to, what, what was my mark going to be. One, it was all this travel we've been talking about to get around the country. Having lived in Washington for 20 plus years, I um, came to the realization that we didn't know everything in Washington and that when you left the Beltway, people had different views um, and actually the issues we thought were important were actually they were concerned about other issues. So. I didn't want to be in New Delhi every day, five days a week, so I wanted to get out and hear what was on the minds of people, talk to Americans, talk to American businesses, talk to Indian youth, um, and so that's why we've been doing So that was a big part of it. I wanted to uh, speak about the, our policy and let people know why the relationship was important to build up as much support as we could, um, and we've been doing that. Um, and I just, I wanted to build um, what the President and Prime Minister had come up with even bigger and deeper. So we've gone into health deeper, we've gone into space cooperation deeper, we've gone into science and innovation deeper. Um, and that's been really uh, exciting. And we are so well aligned as, um, as, as countries. So there really is no typical day. Um, but, and it's, it's really, you know, you hate to peak at this age, but I'm not sure you'll find a better job <laughs> um, at, uh, after this, because it really is so interesting, exciting. We've got a great partner at a really critical time. I think we are kind of at the end of our time, but we have a very special uh, thing now. We have a gift for you that only the Wilder School can give you, and I'm going to invite the Wilder to come up. We have a signed copy of the governor's. Oh, great, 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 great. He has. Mr. Ambassador. Yes, I sir. <coughs> tell you how much I was impressed with what you Thank had you. to say. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, you make a, a, an old man feel younger. <laughs> you have so much vision, positiveness, and you bring it. And Dr. Rao's speaking relative to the vision of our school was tremendous. The nice words he said about me, fine, but more importantly, <laughs> He laid it out right on the line. But I think we need to take a moment to recognize something. The president of this school is of Indian descent. <laughs> of the university. The dean of the school likewise is of Indian descent. The book that I present to you is called Son of Virginia, the only book I've ever written, <laughs> and I think will probably be the last. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But in so doing, I tried to capture what Virginia was. This was where it all started. This was where America came to be known, a little place called Jamestown. Right. Freedom was won from the British at Yorktown. Our nation was reunited in Appomattox when the surrender took place. And so I want to show that through what could happen in Virginia, it could happen in America. And to the extent that we were able to open some doors for some people, you do that. The president does that. The dean does that. And I think the continuing of the lecture series in the name of my good friend, Roger Sen, lends so much to the culmination of the dreams that you went back to, and yet you recognize that what your father had to say to you had all of the merit in the world. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you.